In the words of the great Manny Fresh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dogs and cats, children and babies, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. My name is Devin Morgan, director of the Baseball the Driveline, founder of the Driveline Academy, and this is the Driveline Academy podcast, the world's most dangerous youth baseball podcast. And I am joined, not in person, but in spirit, by my brother, my partner, my co-host, building this thing with me brick by brick, Driveline Academy, international man of mystery, and assistant director, Jeremy Tectiel. Uh, Jeremy's feeling crappy today, and to make sure we still have a podcast for you guys today, I'm just going to be in here talking by myself, sounding like a crazy person. A um, couple housekeeping things right off the bat. Uh, first of all, axbat.com, code DL20, get yourself 20% off. Um, Axbat is uh, proud, I'm very proud to be able to have Axbat as a sponsor, uh, sponsor of the Driveline Academy pod. Uh, very proud that we're able to give you guys 20% off of any bats and stuff that you buy and very happy that that stuff comes back to us in the form of money we put directly into our scholarship fund. So axbat.com code DL20 will get you 20% off. Um, Axe has launched some new bats. Um, for those of you that are buying U-Triple-S-A bats, they have a crazy uh, new U-Trip bat that has a ton of pop. Um, it's a U-Trip bat. It's supposed to have a ton of pop. Um, so go check that out. Code DL20 for 20% off. Um, D for Deuteronomy. L for um, Lightweight. Two zero DL20. Axebat.com. 20% off. Um, and another thing in terms of housekeeping, uh, which is, is that we've got a new training book coming out for youth players. It should be launching at the tail end of this year, um, details to follow. Uh, but, uh, I am looking to get out and roadshow this thing a bit. So if you or someone, you know, is either running or attending a big coaches convention, uh, somewhere in the greater, um, North American area. Uh, give me a holler about it. Um, I'd love to talk to those folks. I'd like to get out there and speak and talk about what we do with youth baseball. Um, talk to coaches about our tools, techniques, and tips. Talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked. Talk about the book. So email me at devin at drivelinebaseball.com. Two E's, D-E-V-E-N at drivelinebaseball.com. Um, so for a solo show, um, I thought it would be appropriate for me to just kind of rant about some stuff that has taken place over the course of the last week. Um, I posted up on the old Twitter um, a graphic that uh, I saw on the USA Hockey website and USA Hockey's approach to competition. Um, and I held that up there knowing full well that USA Baseball has the exact same thing. Um, and you know, the, the little jokey joker tin that I made is that, you know, for USA hockey, um, in the way that they've kind of written out this developmental, um, kind of timeline and using my editing skills, I will once again, like put that right there on the screen for those of you guys that join us on an audio video platform. Um, and the way that USA hockey's development structure is set up. And again, this is their kind of idealized version of what this should look like. Um, they note these different stages of a kid's engagement and exposure to the game. And um, we'll go ahead and just run them down, right? Because note some of you guys uh, aren't going to be joining us on a visual platform. And I want you to be an informed listener. So let's get through it, right? So uh, for ages zero, and I'm, I'm sure I believe that some kids start hockey at zero, uh, ages zero to six, what they call an active start, right? Um, and an active start for kids below six years old um, you're looking at 50 to 60 ice sessions over the course of a year. Um, we want them on the ice two to three times per week. Uh, those sessions are about an hour long. And they're saying, hey, you know, you want to have somewhere between like uh, 34 to 40 quality practices. And they also um, reduce uh, the number of kids on the ice, uh, which maps to my experience of what I was trained when, the, when, I, when, I, when I went through my training for um, Washington youth soccer, right? Uh, small sided games to start them with more touches, less kids on the field. Um, ages six to eight for girls and ages six to nine for boys. So already there's some stratification here and acknowledgement that, that girl ath that female athletes are going to go through uh, puberty a little bit faster. Um, the objective of this stage, uh, which they call fundamentals, F-U-N capitalized, uh, the objective of this stage is to refine fundamental movement skills and begin to acquire basic sport skills. I'm going to say that again. Begin to acquire basic sports skills. So for USA Hockey, they want kids to start to begin to acquire this 
skills that are specific to their sport between the ages of 6 to 8 for girls and 6 to 9 for boys. That's when they want to start acquiring them. Um, does that map to uh, our version of what we see on youth baseball fields from the ages of 6 to 9 right now in this country? Probably not. Um, let's keep going. Uh, ages 8 to 11 for girls, 9 to 12 for boys. Learn to train, okay? So inherently, there's an acknowledgement that kids need to learn how to train. And in so much as my understanding of kind of the structure they're coming up here is that training represents a specific way of kind of engaging with the game, right? And the thought is, is for kids 8 to 11 or 9 to 12, whether they're boys and girls, is that prior to that time, we're giving them the autonomy and kind of some freedom to engage in the game in probably a less structured fashion. But at it around eight to nine, and then through the ages of 11 and 12, we're going to take that time to teach kids to learn how to train because training for something is different than just kind of engaging in it with freedom. And there are merits for, for a kid to be able to in, in do both of those things, but we're going to, in that specific time window, that's where we're going to start to kind of learn that, right? Um, and to talk a little bit more in detail uh, at some of the, the way that that's broken down structurally, um, for those kids uh, from 12 and under, uh, you're looking for 105 to 120 ice sessions. You're on the ice about four times a week, um, 60 plus minute training sessions, and we're talking about 30 to 35 games. Okay. Um, reflect on kind of conventional recreational baseball little league schedule. Um, for us here in the Northwest, that means you're going to start your team training probably in March-ish, maybe early February, depending on how fast your league spins up. Uh, and you're going to play basically March through May. And yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's unrealistic to think that kids in rec ball are going to get somewhere between 25 and 35 games. So really, uh, in terms of of the schedule that's constructed for us on the baseball side in terms of recreational baseball, and then comparing that to what they kind of list out as this idealized progression in hockey, these things are relatively close to each other. Um, 11 through 15 year old girls and 12 to 16 year old boys, what they call this stage, train to train. So we've kind of learned what training should look like. And now we're actually gonna high, kind of hyper-focus on training. Uh, to me, this screams kind of an acknowledgement of what we understand to be a gigantic moment of opportunity in that period of time between around 11 to 16. It's a humongous opportunity window for us to kind of front load the stuff that we can learn in training that we understand to be necessary for kind of like the, the future of this, what, the, of this athlete, of any given athlete. That period of time from like 11 to 16 is highly, highly important, and we want to get the most value as possible as we can. Um, so for those kids, uh, again, 11 to 15-year-old girls, 12 to 16-year-old boys, um, 160 ice sessions in total, around 120 to 130 quality practices, and 40 to 50 games. Okay? So again, when you think about this document, Put it here from USA Hockey. Uh, you can compare that very equally with the document that USA Baseball has uh, constructed in terms of their long-term athletic development, which I'll also put here. And maybe we can actually put one over here and then one over here. I'll see if I can make that happen in editing for those of you joining us on an audio video platform like our good friends at Spotify. Um, it seems significant to me that the very smart people that are constructing these schedules at the top end of the food chain, again, these are NGBs, national governing bodies that can create the structure at the top end about what the sport should look like for youth. They're kind of in like lockstep with each other. Well, why is that? Well, oh, because really smart people are kind of on the same page about some of the developmental opportunities and the way that we want to periodize a kid's acclimation into like a highly competitive environment. And we don't want that to come before we have kids get an opportunity to both learn how to train and then train to train. That's the structure that the very smart men and women that have created this stuff are coming up with. And here's where it gets a little dicey. Uh, again, in this USA hockey developmental document, 
ages 15 to 18 for girls and 16 to 18 to boys. Learn to compete. Again, learn to compete. This is the time to prepare athletes for the competitive environment, continue to refine technical skills, ancillary skills, and develop the physical attributes. Again, ages 15 to 18 for girls, 16 to 18 for boys. What does that look like in terms of structure? Kids are looking for around 200 ice sessions in total, somewhere around five to six times a week. Um, this is interesting. They say that it's a combined and separate practices for team and or the kid's position. Looking at like 130 to 140 quality practices, somewhere around 50 to 60 games. And uh, I wouldn't say I got yelled at on Twitter, but like a lot of people had some opinions. Um because the jokey Jokerson that I made, USA Hockey, player 16, 18, 16 to 18 years old, learn to compete. Youth Baseball, players 5 to 6 years old. The Jersey Mike's Triple Aluminum Flag Day Coach Pitch Milky Way Intergalactic Championship. So when I posted this, and, and, and with intent to kind of like hold up another sports example of how they per they perceive this kind of uh, athletic development timeline and what it should look like in an ideal basis. And what a lot of people came back to me and said that like, well, um, Devin, you don't know much about youth hockey. It's just as bad, if not potentially worse than it is for youth baseball. So great. Everything's terrible. Fantastic. Right? Love it. That's great. Um, which to me, I think, turns this discussion into a very different direction. Uh, Jeremy and I talked uh, at, at a decent amount of length last, last episode about kind of what we understand to be some of the issues with AAU basketball. And to summarize those issues for anybody that hasn't yet listened, um, AAU nowadays... Uh, is probably not going in a great direction when it comes to uh, this over uh, an over inclination towards game results at the expense of opportunities to build skill and uh, a, a, a more well-rounded athletic base. Uh, and carrying with that, because we're playing all these games, is also uh, what can trail with that, which is injury, right? Uh, it's workload. It's workload, it's workload, it's workload. We keep having to talk about this. It's workload. So we understand on the basketball side. And, and again, I'm more than willing to be proven wrong. Uh, but from dipping my toe a little bit in that water, AAU basketball, not going particularly great. Uh, youth hockey in this country, not going particularly great. Youth baseball in this country, not going particularly great. Fantastic. You know, the other thing that United States has, uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase this. The one thing that our country does not have, that most other countries do, is a national ministry of sport. We don't have anybody at the top end of the food chain in terms of the thing that I think government is best suited for, which is defining the foundational principles of our society for how things should work for everyone. Right, if, if government has any purpose, we want to define the edges, right? And we want freedom within those edges to kind of choose our own adventure because that is the American way. But we kind of want to define the edges mostly when it comes to things that affect children because we think it's a good thing to keep kids safe. Okay, so uh, USA Baseball, usabaseballltad.com. You can go to that website uh, and get a chance to take a look at their long-term athletic development. USA Hockey, go to their website, take a, take a couple minutes to take a look at their documents that they have about long-term athletic development. Um, are there some differences in the way that USA Baseball and USA Hockey uh, structure coach training? Yes, I think USA, I, I think we definitely have some opportunities to uh continue to give coaches, youth co youth baseball coaches in this country, more structure in terms of how to actually exemplify this stuff that we idealize in terms of practice plans, season scheduling, roster building, et cetera. But if we know youth basketball not going great, youth hockey not going great, youth baseball not going great, 
and I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here, and I don't have Jeremy beside me to like cut down on some of my inclination to go that direction. So I'm trying to temper my perspective on this a little bit, but we got stuff to fix because kids are getting hurt. Like full stop, full stop. Things have to change. Something has to change. A national ministry of sport has the opportunity to change that in so much is you have the opportunity to define the edges. I have very specific thoughts about the ideal way to train a kid to get the most out of the sport of baseball. It's the thing that I have basically dedicated my life to other than my wife and my children. And I certainly don't know everything. There's a ton of stuff that I don't know. There's a ton of things that I am sure I continue to remain ignorant about. But as I find those things, I try to learn as much as I can. I think that there is a specific way that you can go about training a kid to get the most out of their baseball present and future. I don't think it has to be an either or thing. Would I expect that I could sit at a table with let's say 10 other men and women around this game and get everybody to agree on the way to develop a kid? Absolutely not. That ain't going to happen. No shot. Uh, I wouldn't presume that that's possible, and I don't think it's necessary. But what I do think is necessary is we have to spend some time to consider what's safe and what's appropriate. We have to define the boundaries of what is and is not fitting that type of behavior in terms of the environments that our kids are put into. We have to, because if we don't, we are allowing for these type of outcomes in terms of kids getting injured and kids getting run of our game and the most massive issue with attrition compared to any other sport to persist. We are allowing these issues to germinate and grow and turn into tumors. And the more that those tumors are allowed to grow and not be attacked, and we don't define these type of edges, we are staring the future death of our game in the face. And I, I know that that sounds like a crazy thing to say. But tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me that everything is going great. In the course of writing the book, um, there's a whole chapter in there talking about youth injury risks and what we understand to be the most, uh, the, the biggest levers you can turn in, in the, the most significant areas of risk. Um, one of the things that I kind of looked into was the total amount of games being played by like large tournament organizers. When the year to year increase over the course of a long period of time from like the events that were, uh, the total number of events that were conducted in 2013 versus the number of events conducted in 2023. And there is like the, the percentile increase in that number is in the thousands. What does that tell you about the number of teams and the number of players that are participating? It's growing nearly exponentially. We understand uh, that youth baseball has turned into a multi-billion dollar business. IMG Academy just got sold for $1.89 billion? Uh, do I have that right? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, $1.25 billion. You know what IMG uh, charges for being there in their baseball program? It's a five-digit number that, if I remember correctly, starts with an eight. There's a lot of money on the table in the form of parents like me who have kids that want to play baseball and they want to get the most out of it and have some disposable income that they can throw at the problem. And again, I am not trying to extract myself. I'm not trying to extract uh, the Driveline Academy from that conversation because we take checks to train kids and put those kids on a team. The difference is, is what are our incentives? What is our value proposition? What are we trying to do? Our thing is player development. You go to IMG Academy's website. 
and you tell me what it says about the mechanism, the tools, and the success that they have had developing kids. Just take a gander. Take a look at their website. Am I saying that IMG Academy is some sort of big boogeyman? No, absolutely not. Abs absolutely not. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you can look to companies like IMG uh, as an indicator of where the market is going. And if the market continues to go in the direction where recreational baseball, which could function as an environment to both build engagement, build fun, play games, and build skill, if recreational baseball continues to suffer, but you have parents like me who have kids like mine that want to play this game, where are those kids going to go? They're going to find a travel team. They're going to find a club team. They're going to find a select team. They're going to find tournament organizers to put those teams into games. And the longer that that environment persists, completely unchecked, completely unchecked in the form of no agreed upon boundaries of appropriate behavior, of safe behavior, of coaching accreditation, of any type of acknowledgement about the biological, cognitive, and emotional reality of children. Why are we surprised when 6U games involve intentional walks? Six-year-olds. They're six. What does USA Hockey want for six-year-old kids? This early development period is essential for acquiring fundamental movement skills, running, gliding, jumping, kicking, catching, striking, that lay the foundation for more complex movements, thereby preparing children for a physically active lifestyle. USA Hockey encourages activity that incorporates fundamental movement skills in the four environments that lead to physical literacy. In the water, in the form of swimming, on the ground, in the form of athletics, in the air, in the form of gymnastics, on the ice and snow, in the form of sliding and or skating. Kids should start with a link should start with a learn to skate program and then learn to play program as their initial steps into ice hockey. That's not 6U intentional walks. Why is someone why why are we intentionally walking kids at 6U? The coaching answer to that uh could be to to keep the double play intact. I get it. Fundamentally get it. Is that an appropriate learning environment for a child? Does that learning environment maximize a kid's opportunity to develop foundational attributes that are going to help them play this game for longer? Well, no. We're optimizing for the game result. That's exactly what that is. You can look at USA Baseball's long-term athletic development document. Baseball development pathway stages of the American development model. Entry to seven. So they, they don't have it as much as like the zero year, but entry, right? Zero, zero to seven years old. Activate. Getting started. Fun socialization. Basic movement. Backyard play. Seven to 12. The discovery phase. Learning fundamentals. Motivation. Organized play. Motivation is an interesting one. Because we're not talking about the parent's motivation. We're not talking about my motivation as a parent. We're talking about the child's motivation. 12 to 14, progress, competency, hone mechanics, autonomy. Great. Hey, everybody's not going to play this game forever. I watched Tony Hawk Doc the other day. Uh, if, you, if you want to get a great perspective on young people's cognitive development, and again, this Gene Piaget a uh, formal concrete operational stage and formal operational stage, watch a Tony Hawk doc because he talks about the first time he went to play baseball. Went up to the plate, confidence in hand, knew he was going to do great, struck out. And if I remember correctly, he said it felt like the world ended. Fast forward, Tony discovers skating. He has autonomy to engage with the game that he wants. And they talk about Tony, Tony being a young kid that cultivates this set of the sense of determination in the way that he engages with his own development, where he would try tricks and fall and fail. And when that happened, he just kind of like shrinks his concentration. 
and he, and he works to get closer to this ultimate expression of what he's trying to do creatively. That's not what our current system of youth baseball looks like. And that's a problem. It, it, it's, it's a problem because of what it portends for our future. Again, come back to the USA Baseball LTAD doc, right? In that uh, zero or entry to seven-year-old stage, 75% practice, 25% competition, days per week in season, one to two days, competition window, four months. Discovery phase, ages seven to 12, 75% practice, 25 competition, one to two days per week, competition schedule, four months. Progress, ages 12 to 14, 65% practice, 35% competition, two to three days per week, four to eight month competition season. You can't tell me that front loading on the competition side of things for young kids who have the Tony Hawk determination in them at some stage in the future, but they don't have it right now. We are front loading the competition results for those type of kids who are going to have the Tony Hawk response to our game. It felt like the world ended when I struck out. We're front loading consequence that doesn't exist. And then we're surprised when kids leave our game. What type of fucking sense does that make? What's going to change it? You mean to tell me that these large tournament organizations that are making hand over fist money have any incentivization to change? I would love that to be true. I would love to wake up tomorrow to an email that says, hey, we think you've got a point and we're interested in having a conversation and how we can continue to do the thing we do in a way that is more safe and considerate and realistic for our athletes. I'd love to wake up to that email. I'd love to wake up to that phone call. I'm not holding my breath because there is zero incentive for anybody to change. We're trying to change it. We're trying to change it in the way that we run our program. But right now, the sum total of that, expo of that program is uh, less than 350 kids over the course of this country. They're either on an academy team in Washington or Arizona or in the academy online program. It's not enough. It's not enough. And this isn't about me stumping for kids throwing plyos and doing J-bands or like training for bat speed. I mean, you should. It's not about that, though. It's about all this other stuff that has nothing to do with training and has everything to do with a logical acknowledgement of what is appropriate for children and what isn't. Because some of this stuff is, is not. Some of this stuff is not. Full stop. And all of it turns the flywheel of all the other injury risk stuff that we have to deal with right now. The more that we obsess and hyper fixate on games being the way that we quantify, the way that we contextualize our kids' experience at this thing, there is one way to get that, to get that resource. You want to play more games? Because that's the way that you demonstrate value to your parents and to your kids? Well, you have to play more. You have to play more. I've said this before and I will say it again. When I spoke at ABCA a couple years ago, one of my slides up there had an 11U team that played 132 games in a year during COVID. My fear is that that's not going to continue to be an outlier. Because if there's a perception that what those guys did was successful, because they ended up on some idiotic fucking leaderboard, a ranking of 11U teams, what do you think everybody else is going to do? We're all logical people. Oh, those guys got ranked? I guess we got to do what they did. And you're talking about parents, right? This is youth baseball. So largely, the majority of the coaches are not professional. The majority of those coaches are highly invested. And the majority of those coaches are vastly undertrained. And that's a dangerous mix. Because this is the result. I've dedicated my life to this. So yeah, I've, I've, done, I've done the homework to dig deep into workload. Try to understand it. 
try to understand it in a baseball sport specific way, try to understand it in, in terms of every other sport. Uh, I've, I've taken the time to, to talk to Andrew Bartman at USA Baseball. Bart's the man. I've taken the time to look at these other sports, long-term athletic development documents to understand what other people that are at the top end of the food chain of our sport think is appropriate. Parents don't have that time. They don't have exposure to it. So, they follow the Joneses, the Joneses, man. They do what everybody else does. We have speed limits for a reason. And for anybody that knows me well and hears me publicly stump for the value of speed limits is probably laughing right now. My wife and my children, I love you very much. Uh, but we have speed limits for a reason. We have rules against drunk driving for a reason. And yeah, I'm going to equate an 11-year-old team playing a 132-game schedule with drunk driving. And I don't feel any type of shame about that. I, I think that's an apt analogy. You can drive drunk, best case scenario, nobody gets hurt. You can drive drunk, worst case scenario, somebody ends up dead. Maybe that somebody's you, maybe it's somebody else you hurt. You can have 11-year-olds play a 132-game schedule and maybe everybody gets through it safe. Maybe somebody tears the growth plate off the bone. But the potential capacity for a not negative outcome doesn't mean that that's safe or recommended or smart behavior. We have to define some of these edges in our sport. And I'm not saying that every baseball coach in the country needs to get in a room and reach in a room and reach some sort of consensus about the way to execute that thing. Uh, I love my baseball coaches. I don't expect that that's ever going to happen. But we somewhere along the way agreed that like 4660 was the right dimensions for a, a field for kids to start playing this game on. Somewhere along the line, we decided that like 5070 and 5480 were like good progressions to get kids towards 6090. Nobody's ever with conviction said 12 year olds 12 year olds shouldn't play more than 50 games in a calendar year and here's the rule that prohibits that and here's the rule that's going to be exemplified by no not the uh recreation just recreational baseball but also recreational baseball and club baseball everybody's gonna have to fall under the same rule set nobody's ever done that before which is part of the problem The fact that we don't have rules in a governing body in a national ministry of sport that can control this stuff means you have all this variance. The door is open for it. And I think that needs to change. Again, this isn't about skill. This isn't about me stumping for a specific modality of training. This isn't even me saying that like strength is important, bat speed is important, throwing velocity is important. Hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we are going to have this like abstinence only training revolution. Thank you, uh, Driveline OG OC, where pitchers are just going to have to agree that like you can't throw the ball harder than 85 miles an hour. Sure, I don't care. This isn't about Major League Baseball. This is about children in youth baseball and the fact that we do not have guidelines about what is safe and should be permissible when it comes to the way that these kids are dreamt into competition in the way that they're coached. And I bet you what, if you're listening to this and you're going, hey, Devin, you have no right to suggest that the government should be able to tell me what to do here because I know best. Let me uh, answer your question with a question. Would you allow that in your kid's classroom? Would you allow, you go, you will go into, um, God, Man, it's it's been a while. Um, what grade are kids in when they are six years old? My kids are old now. I forgot. First grade. So uh, it's the season. Schools have started up. Some of you have kids that you dropped into a first grade classroom this year. 
and you probably have some sort of orientation with that with that teacher, right? They're going to tell you about how the classroom is going to work this year, the stuff you're going to work on, etc. So you imagine. Let's all put on our imaginary glasses. I walk into this classroom, and there's a teacher up at the front of the class. They seem pleasant, professionally dressed, not a crazy person. And they say, "Hey, you know, I'm uh, I'm I'm Teacher Joe, and uh, I haven't been accredited." I haven't gone through any uh, state controlled, recognized, approved system to teach. Like I know what I'm doing. I got this. I've, I've been teaching kids for five years. I've been teaching kids for 10 years and this is how I do it. There is no way any parent on this planet is going to hear that speech and not beeline immediately for the principal's room and go, hey, you got a guy teaching kids in this school that isn't a teacher. You don't get to call yourself that unless you've gone through the process of accreditation. Right now, in this country... A lot of guys and girls call themselves coach that have no fucking business using that word. And I think that needs to change. I think it needs to change because I don't expect that it's going to change if we don't do something. There's too much money involved. There's too much incentive structure to prevent that change. Our industry is not going to self-regulate. So... What the fuck are we going to do? Are we going to allow through indifference for this to continue the way that it is? Hey, like, my kids are good. Kids in my academy are good. Kids in my household are good. My house is not on fire. What everybody else? Is everybody else in a good place? Does this drastic and alarming trend of increase to surgical intervention to the elbows of children? Is that good? Are we going in the right direction? Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong and I'll shut up about it. But all the other signal that I look at does not suggest that I am wrong. It suggests that in this country, we have massive, massive, massive issues because we have over committed to giving infinite freedom to coaches who can't behave appropriately with the freedom that they've been given. They're underqualified and undertrained and disincentivized to do the right thing. And again, I'm not painting with too broad of a brush. We have a thousand people an episode that listen to this show, and I don't think they're all hate listeners. And I'm pretty sure that that a thousand of you, because you're tuning into this thing, if, if I had to lay a bet, I think all of you guys and girls are trying to do this thing the right way. You're trying to do it the same way I was trying to do it 12, 13 years ago when I first started coaching. God damn it, I love you. I love you and I appreciate you for trying to do it the right way. The issue is, is when you think about the sum totality of us versus them, of people that are trying to learn everything they can to do this the right way versus people who haven't done that, haven't been taught, coaches that haven't been coached, or people whose incentives are perverted to not do this thing right way, man, it's, uh, you know, like 300. Very small amount of us, very large amount of them. It's the Battle of Thermopylae. God, I wish, I wish Jeremy was here. He's a trivia guy. He could heat check me about this. Um, I think we need a National Ministry of Sport. I think that National Ministry of Sport should talk to experts Sport-specific expert, childhood development experts, child psychology experts, to define what's safe and what's isn't. I think 
once that curriculum is defined, I think you go to the large guys, large recreational organizations, to large tournament organizations, and say, hey, it's not a free fly zone anymore. Things have to change. And if you don't change and you don't agree on some unified rules for the safe and appropriate way that this is going to be conducted, we're going to let everybody know that you don't. Right? The problem is the cat's already out of the bag. So we, we got to course correct a little bit and figure out how we're going to get to where we want to go with organizations that are already in place. Some of those organizations, Little League International, for example, are already largely in a good place. Pitch Smart, good enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. And the Little League schedule, generally, either by rule or by uh, logistics, doesn't allow you to play 60, 70, 80, 100 games. But the issue isn't just recreational baseball. It's kids that play rec ball, kids, kids that play club, right? They do both. And currently, we have no system to track the sum totality of what a kid does on both sides of the equation, right? Right hand, left hand, not in a good place. That's a solvable problem in the year of our Lord, 2023. When my daughter started wrestling, she had to get her national wrestling ID card. She has a number. So when she is doing club wrestling, whether she's doing high school wrestling, uh, she has a card. She has a database. And in that database, pretty sure you should be able to see all of her competition matches. You can figure it out. We have APIs, right? We have the ability to create a database that tracks every player and their usage and their pitch count. Is it going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, PG has a diamond cast, right? Um, you hear all the time that like diamond cast stuff isn't, isn't, isn't perfect, right? It's, it's inputted by a child. Uh, when I think about how to solve this problem, I think a lot about um, some of the stuff that Kyle Bodie, El Jefe, CEO, I'm CEO, founder of Driveline Baseball, has talked about when it comes to like uh, large language models. Um, when you are engaging those type of things, the intention is not to be 100% perfect 100% of the time. But at scale, can you make it largely directionally accurate? Yeah, that's a, that's a solvable problem. All this stuff, solvable problems. And again, you don't need every coach in the country to agree. What you need is a small number of people that make decisions for large organizations. Those are the people you need in agreement. Those are the ones. And... In so much as it matters, this is uh, this is going to be the thing that I'm going to be stumping for at the ABCA youth uh, uh, the youth clinic that happens before ABCA. It's a thing I'm going to be stumping for at the ABCA. Um, it's the thing that I stump for in the new book that we have coming out, uh, and I don't think I'm the only one. You know. Uh, the messages that I got about the whole USA soccer, or I'm sorry, USA hockey versus USA baseball thing. No, nobody was like, oh, no, it's everything's fine. Everything's good. It wasn't that. It was that, oh, no, no, no. You're under indexing for how bad hockey is because it's just as bad as, as, as baseball. Great. Kudos, guys. Um, you need a small number of people to agree. And those people, once they reach consensus and agreement about what is safe and permissible for children, the environments that they should be in, the frequency with which they should be playing real games, you create that structure, and that structure gets defined by the large organizations that have the, the most significant uh, amount of our players in them. And yes, do we need to solve how you track a kid between rec ball and club ball? Yeah, that's a solvable problem. I don't even know that I would even start with that though. I might start with, Hey, look, six year old baseball shouldn't be kept. Shouldn't be played with a score. It shouldn't. 
USA Baseball, LTAD, USA Hockey. Look at these long-term athletic development models. Do any of them suggest that that's appropriate? You've heard me scream about Gene Piaget and this, you know, again, the Tony Hawk thing. Struck out, felt like the world ended. These are defined realities of the cognitive development of children. I didn't make this stuff up. I just saw how it could be applied to youth baseball because of the opportunity, because the current environment of youth baseball is so fucked up. I think those are the boundaries that we need to define. And once defined, hey, speed limit's 60 here. Your 11-year-old shouldn't play more than 50 games in a calendar year. Whatever that number is, and I'm not, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, but we can define the edges of what our game should look like for children. We can define what's safe for our game in the way that children participate in it. We can define what is acceptable and permissible conduct by the coaches that coach it. Everything else, man, hey, market opportunity. You want to teach your kids to squash the bug and swing down, short to it, long through it? Good luck. Maybe you're right. You want to teach your kids, be the next Greg Maddox, harvest velocity for command? Good luck. Maybe you're right. I don't care. What I do care about is for a large percentage of the kids, meaning all of them, are they able to interact with our game in a safe way? Right now, the answer to that is maybe. Good luck. Hopefully you get a good coach. Hopefully you get a good coach. Hopefully your coach is in an organization that does have its priorities oriented in what I would say is the correct fashion. Hope is a shitty development strategy and hope is also a shitty way to protect children. That's what this is about. So I do believe that we need a national ministry of sport in this country. I do believe that national ministry of sport should have the authority to dictate to large organizations and small organizations what is permissible in the way that our children are treated and engage with this game. I think we just define the edges. Everything else, fire beware, and I'm fine with that. But I think safety is paramount. So we gotta we gotta figure out what that looks like. I think emotional safety is paramount. So we gotta figure out what that looks like. And again, you don't have to go zero to one because if you look at all these major sports, they have a long term they have a defined long term athletic development curriculum that is made in consideration of children by experts. Nobody fucking follows it. Okay. Hey, look, man, some of the hard work's already been done. We just have to solve the other thing? All right. It's a solvable problem. It's a solvable problem if people give a shit. And uh, I know I'm not the only one that cares deeply about this. Um, and if you know folks who care deeply about this and they are highly invested in making change, Devin at DrivelineBaseball.com, let's talk. I'm really fired up uh, going into 2024 to stop talking about this shit and start making some stuff happen. And again, my house is fine. My house is not on fire. It's not about my kids in so much like kids in the academy program, kids in academy online, etc. It's not about that. It's about all of them. Structure systems in place that keep them safe, keep them healthy, Emotionally and physically. That's what it's about. We have no control over there right now. That needs to stop. So, um, thank you for joining me for this rant. Uh, man, I, I really, uh, I don't like this show turning into like the, you know, the youth baseball bummer power hour. I, uh, I, I, I hate that, but, um, sometimes you got to call a spade a spade, man, and be honest about what we got. So, um, axbat.com code DL20, 20% off. Go get yourself some new bats. Put some money in the scholarship uh, kitty for us at the academy so we can have our kids uh, continue to be able to, to play this thing. Um, what else? 
books coming out. Uh, I got some new products coming out that I'll be able to talk about launch times and release dates on the, on the hitting side. So that'll be fun. Um, youth baseball development certification. If you're looking for some tools for for kind of some good ideas for how to like, uh, exemplify, uh, these ideals and this approach to youth player development, our youth baseball development certification is a great product to start with. Uh, we have free youth training plans, uh, that you can get as well. Um, I have revised ones that should be launching, uh, in October. Um, I just think we got to make some changes at a systemic level if we really want to fix what's going on with this game. And that's what I'm here for. It is the one thing in my life that I think I am compelled to do. Uh, And I'm going to keep pushing this way uh, until you find me taking a dirt nap. So uh, thank you guys for joining us. I apologize for turning in the the Youth Academy uh, bummer power hour. I love you guys very much. Thank you for the likes, subscribes, all the the reviews and that type of stuff is hugely appreciated uh, because it helps uh, the ecosystem of Jack and Jerry ecosystem. It helps the ecosystem of Spotify, of Apple uh, help us to continue to like amplify our stuff to other people. Um, So that's great. Uh, hugely appreciate the support you guys have already given us and we're going to keep pushing, um, man. It just like, uh, I think we need change and, uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to drive it. Thank you guys very much. We'll catch you next time.